Good afternoon. My name is Christian DuPont, and I'm the director of the John J. Burns Library for Rare Books and Special Collections and Archives here at Boston College. It is my great pleasure to welcome you and to introduce our speaker, Patrick Lonergan, who has been with us this semester as our spring 2019 Burns Visiting Scholar in Irish Studies. Patrick comes to us from the National University of Ireland, Galway, where he has been Professor of Drama and Theatre Studies since 2013, having previously served as a lecturer in English from 2005. He was also the director of the Singh Summer School for Irish Drama from 2008 to 2014, and is currently a director of the Galway International Arts Festival. He is an editorial associate of Contemporary Theatre Review and a member of several other editorial boards. At NUI Galway, Patrick is academic leader of the digitization of the archives of the Abbey and Gate Theatres, a project to create the world's largest multimedia digital theatre archive. He has lectured on Irish literature at many venues internationally, including, most recently, Tokyo, Florence, Florianopolis, Brazil, Wrocław, Poland, and this past year, Patrick was elected to the Royal Irish Academy. Patrick has written or edited 12 influential books on Irish drama. These include Theatre and Globalization, winner of the UK Theatre Book Prize in 2008, The Theatre and Films of Martin McDonough in 2012, and Theatre and Social Media in 2015. His new history of Irish drama and theatre since 1950 has been published just this month by Bloomsbury. This semester at Boston College, Patrick has been teaching the course on Theatre and Globalization, examining how the growth of world theatre has shaped the world of dramatists in an expanded literary marketplace. All this while utilizing the Burns Library resources for his research and writing. He organized and hosted last Saturday a one-day conference on advances in archival research and their effect on teaching and research in literature and the performing arts. We warmly welcome Patrick to the podium to give us a foretaste of the topic of his next book with his lecture entitled Shakespeare and the Modern Irish Theatre, Staging Anglo-Irish Relations from 1916 to Brexit. Patrick. Um, thank you very much, uh, Christian. So before beginning, I would like to thank Christian DuPont uh, and James Murphy very sincerely for everything they've done during my time here as the visiting Burns Scholar. Um, I also want to thank the staff of the Burns Library and of Irish Studies and the wider BC community. Together with my family, we've been given an extremely warm welcome, a uh, very kind uh, welcome. So the paper I'm going to give today draws on some of the research and some of the writing I've been able to do here, uh, though of course I'm all also hoping to get plenty more done before I leave. Um, it's been exceptionally beneficial to have space here, to have time here uh, to think and to work in such a stimulating environment. So this is a paper about Shakespeare, but it's also a paper about Ireland. And for that reason, I want to start with James Joyce. James Joyce's Ulysses is famously obsessed with Shakespeare, opening, just like Hamlet does, with a young man who's dressed in black and who is haunted by the ghost of a parent. And it works towards a moment in the Circe chapter in which Bloom and Stephen look into a mirror and find the reflection of Shakespeare gazing back at them, a reflection that is crowned by the reflection of the reindeer antlered hat rack in the hall, as Joyce writes. His novel also responds to Shakespeare's only Irish character, Captain MacMorris from Henry V, by addressing MacMorris's infamous question what ish my nation? What ish my nation, he says, is a villain and a bastard and a knave and a rascal. What is my nation? Who talks of my nation? So the kind of belligerent Irishman stereotype we see back in the 1590s. And the word ish, in case it's not obvious, is Shakespeare's attempt to render an Irish accent. Well done, Shakespeare. Um, and of course, the words uh, used to describe Ireland are far from complimentary. Now, there's been a lot of debate about this passage. You can interpret it from several points of view. Is it Shakespeare uh, being derogatory to the Irish or other things going on? And all I'll really say about that is that the debate exists. It's not straightforward. Um, but the words are reimagined by Joyce. They're put into the mouth of the citizen in the Cyclops chapter midway through the book. What is your nation, if I may ask, says the citizen to Bloom. And Bloom's celebrated answer is, Ireland. I was born here, Ireland. A response that defines nationality in relation to birth rather than ethnicity. 
And not to be too fanciful about that, we could say that that's anticipating the provisions of the Good Friday Agreement by almost 80 years. But where I most wanted to start is with a joke from the Scylla and Charybdis chapter, which is the one set in the National Library, in which there is a long debate about Shakespeare, who is discussed in the context of the Irish literary revival. Yes, indeed, the Quaker librarian said, a most instructive discussion. Mr. Mulligan, I'll be bound, has his theory too of Hamlet and of Shakespeare. All sides of life should be represented. He smiled on all sides equally. Book Mulligan thought, puzzled. Shakespeare, he said. I seem to know the name. A flying sunny smile reigned in his loose features. To be sure, he said, remembering brightly, the chap that writes like sing. Now, there are many ways of interpreting that joke about John Milton Sidney and the leading dramatist of the Irish Literary Revival, who died in 1909, quite a long time after Shakespeare, um, dying at the tragically young age of 37, leaving behind the Playboy of the Western World and several other important writings. And the suggestion that Singh influenced Shakespeare could be seen in many ways. You know, it's making fun of Irish insularity. It's mocking some of the extremes of Irish cultural nationalism. It's also Buck Mulligan just being a bit absurd, as he so often does. But it's a joke that had been made by other people too. Um, in 1913, for example, the playwright St. John Irvine had written an adaptation of Sheridan's play, The Critics. And in his version, in the 1913 version, a group of Dublin theatre critics stand in the vestibule of the Abbey Theatre while a performance of Hamlet is underway. So if you're in the audience of the Abbey, you're looking at the stage, and on the stage is the best view of the Abbey, um, which is quite interesting. So the critics are talking about the play, trying to identify it, and they mistakenly think that it's not written by Shakespeare, but that it's a new Irish peasant play, such as might have been written by Singh. And they have a ridiculous debate about whether King Hamlet is a ghost or a leprechaun. It's inconclusive. Um, somebody suggests to them that they might need to double check their facts, and one of the critics responds in a passage that I think retains its relevance now. Facts, he said. People don't read newspapers for facts. Good lord, man, if we started printing facts, the public would go out of its mind. I'm a fact. You're a fact. He's a fact. But you don't think people want to read about us. They want to read about things that never happen. They want to forget they're alive. They want to be chloroformed, and that's what our job is. <laughs> 1913 could be 2013 or indeed 2019. And when the play concludes, the critics are told the name of its author. Ah yes, Shakespeare, said Mr. Barbary. That's the queer name. I should think he comes from Cork. <laughs> so, same joke. Um, I think it's unlikely that Joyce was aware of the play. I, I mean, it's a work in progress, so I will certainly try and find out, but I think it's unlikely. Um, but I think either way, Irvine's joke and Buck Mulligan's joke both contain a truth that I think it's possible to acknowledge intuitively, if not literally. So, you know, when we think about the history of a national literature, we tend to have a sense of writers influencing each other in a kind of chronological lineage. And to believe that Shakespeare begat Joyce, who begat Beckett, who begat Marina Carr, and so on. But in a society, the reputation of writers and their works work a bit differently, I think. Joyce's joke in Ulysses shows his awareness that writers' reputations arise not just from the circulation of their books or their plays, but from the recirculation and the reimagining of those texts through time. So that joke about saying is actually Joyce trying to tell us how to read Ulysses itself, because the entire structure of Ulysses is predicated on the idea that a new book, James Joyce's Ulysses, can change the way we read an old poem, Homer's Odyssey, forever. In such a context, Shakespeare really can seem like the chap that writes like Singh, just as Homer is the chap that writes like James Joyce. Singh's innovation was to poeticize the version of the English language that had first come to Ireland during the Elizabethan period. And what this meant, and this is frequently recorded, is that Irish audiences who had been to Singh's plays 
commented on how it changed the way they heard Shakespeare afterwards. And this is attested to by Buck Mulligan's joke, as well as by Irvine's adaptation of the critics. So that's the suggestion that I want to make today, that Shakespeare is a figure that Irish writers and Irish readers and Irish audiences have reimagined and reread for most of the last century. And with Brexit hanging over us, sorry, um, it seems important to consider again how Shakespeare could be a figure that might allow Ireland and England to think about each other in new and possibly different ways. But what I'm also suggesting is that maybe paradoxically, Shakespeare has always been a way for Ireland to think about itself, to think about its literature, to think about its history, to think about its possible futures. So what I'm going to be suggesting today is that the many versions of Shakespeare I will be describing are also many versions of Ireland since 1916. Now there was Shakespeare before that. And before the opening of the Abbey Theatre in 1904, there had been at least 5,000 individual productions of Shakespeare in Dublin alone, starting in the 1660s and continuing in an unbroken tradition thereafter. So this list, which you're never going to read in its entirety, um, gives you all the plays listed in order of popularity down through the centuries. You will probably be unsurprised to see that Hamlet is by far the most popular of Shakespeare's plays in Dublin. It appeared there on average once almost every three years. Some of those performances are historically of huge significance. Um, the first time David Garrick, the great Shakespearean actor, played Hamlet, he didn't do so in London, he did so in Dublin, at Smock Alley. And the very first time on record that a woman played Hamlet was not in London, but was in Dublin. And it was in the year 1741, in Smock Alley Theatre, the woman's name was Fanny Furnival. So, lots of interesting things there. And the popularity then of key plays remains largely unchanged from one decade to the next. So this gives you uh, the three most popular plays listed by decade. And you can see there it's much the same as now. Hamlet, Othello, Lear uh, appear all the time, all the way through. When we were doing this research, I found myself trying to relate this to Irish history. And so I was very interested to imagine what kind of Shakespeare might have been performed in Ireland just after the Great Famine, thinking surely this would have to be reflected in some way on our stages. And what I found is that the 1850s were the peak period for performances of Shakespeare in Dublin. There were 664 individual performances of Shakespeare in that decade, in the 1850s. So this is an average of more than one a week in Dublin. Like you don't have one a week on average in London now. So it's an enormous amount and it tells us something about his place in the culture. Shakespeare then also found his way into the lives of ordinary Dubliners through other means. By the end of the 19th century, many middle-class Irish families owned acting editions of Shakespeare's plays. So what would happen is if you had a family gathering, if it was Christmas, you would take down your editions and your family would act out the play together. And the Irish family acting out Macbeth kind of makes a certain amount of sense, I think. <laughs> and maybe not. So, that's why when you get to a play like Sean O'Casey's The Shadow of a Gunman, uh, premiering in 1923, he gives us two characters, two tenement dwellers, who can quote Shakespeare very freely. So one of them, Daveron, quotes, the village cock had thrice done salutation to the morn. And Seamus, his companion, is instantly able to say, Shakespeare, Richard III, Act V, Scene Three. It was Ratcliffe said that to Richard just before the Battle of Bosworth. Now, of course, O'Casey's characters are meant to be seen as different from the other people that they live with. They're meant to be seen as standing out from the crowd, uh, not necessarily in a good way. But the point about this is that Shakespeare was exaggerating a reality and not inventing something that was not true. For those who might be uh, interested in following up on this, all of this is in a database which is available on the Anyway Go Away website um, from a project that was completed with the support of the Irish Research Council. So what I want to say really is that the notion that Shakespeare was a vehicle for British imperialism would not really have made sense to most Irish theatre audiences or readers from the 1660s to 1922. Um, even a play like 
Henry V, which is now seen by many in Ireland as jingoistic and anti-Irish, was well received when it was played in Dublin. Though, interestingly, the Irishman Captain MacMorris was usually dropped from any staging of the play there. Um, in fact, I have been unable to find any evidence that the words, what ish my nation, were ever spoken on an Irish stage in a performance of Henry V. Um, but I'm still looking. So, there has been a change. And um, what I would suggest is that if we want to find a single turning point in this history, a good place to start might be the 23rd of April, 1960. And depending on your perspective, you will be able to guess where I'm going with this. And on that day, as it began, the Anglican Archbishop of Dublin, his name was John Henry Bernard, he was giving his Easter sermon at Christ Church Cathedral, and he was very preoccupied by news of the Great War, appealing to his congregation to pray for their Russian comrades in arms, whom he was keen to characterize as fellow Christians who were celebrating Easter too. Like Ireland and Britain, he said, the Russians were engaged in a war of right against might. I spoke of the war as a crusade, he said, and those who treat the way of the cross together draw nearer to each other as they draw nearer to the place of the cross. Kind of conveniently forgetting the Christianity of the Germans, but never mind. He then recited some famous lines. For he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother, be he ne'er so vile, this day shall gentle his condition. And this is a quotation from, yet again, Henry V taken from the famous scene in which the king encourages his troops to put aside the differences of nation, of Ireland, England, Scotland and Wales, uh, to band together in order to defeat their shared enemy. Now the Archbishop saw himself as both Irish and British. The subtitle of a 2007 biography available here at the Burns Library refers to him as the leader of the Southern Unionists. So his invocation of Shakespeare uh, was an assertion, I think, of a shared cultural identity between England and Ireland. And given what we know about cultural nationalism at that time, it was inherently a political thing for him to do. But even so, when we read the sermon, we find that he was thinking of Shakespeare in a much broader way, as a force for transcending divisions. It would be well for all of us, he told his congregation, if we learned to apply the great words of Shakespeare at home as well as abroad, to our own countrymen, no less than to our comrades in arms in other lands. So what we find in the sermon is that the words we and our become extremely slippery. Sometimes it's the congregation. Sometimes it's all the people of Ireland. Sometimes it's the United Kingdom in its entirety, including Ireland. And sometimes it's all the allies fighting the great war together. So Shakespeare, whom he calls our great poet, becomes a rallying point, becomes a figure whose artistry is transformed into common ground that might unify the people of Ireland. Now, why was the Archbishop Bernard's allusion to Henry V particularly topical on that day? The Shakespeare people in the room will know the 23rd of April is a significant day. It is the day not only of Shakespeare's birth, but also of his death. So the 23rd of April, 1916, was the 300th anniversary of Shakespeare's death. A variety of events have been planned to celebrate that occasion in Ireland, albeit that a wish to avoid any suggestion of idolatry meant that most of them had been pushed back to the 1st of May. But there were lots of interesting things. There was an amateur production of Hamlet on the stage of the Abbey Theatre, where it was well received, nobody saw any leprechauns. Uh, people had scheduled lectures, they had scheduled special talks, and very interestingly, the Irish Times had scheduled the publication of a special supplement that would celebrate the tercentenary, and it was to have appeared on the 24th of April, <coughs> excuse me, 1916. Why didn't it appear on the 24th of April, 1916? Because of the Easter Rising. Uh, the supplement never made it into print. The Archbishop's speech was published, but mostly went unread, and most of these events were cancelled. And the reason is that on the 24th of April, a band of Irish rebels took over key buildings in Dublin and declared an Irish Republic. 
But even so, like the Unionist Reverend Bernard, Bernard, the leaders of the 1916 Rising were able to reconcile a sense of national identity with a love of Shakespeare. Parik Pierce had placed the study of Shakespeare firmly within the curriculum of St. Enda's, his school. And his sister Mary Bridget recalled the hidden fire and ardent sincerity in Pierce's reciting of Shakespeare's verse. As, for instance, when he gave Mark Antony's famous speech over the body of Julius Caesar, she says he uh, recited this with the tenderness of a mother crooning over her child. If you know Pierce's works uh, and how mothers figure in them, that's a really interesting statement. During the Rising itself, some of the volunteers read Julius Caesar to pass the time. One of them, Joseph de Brune, recorded in his diary that the play was the first Shakespearean play I saw, and my favourite. And he observed that the characterisation of Cassius and Brutus made for an interesting study. Now, given that Julius Caesar explores the descent of a country from rebellion to civil war, and from there to tyranny, it kind of displays a bit of evidence that perhaps the Easter rebels may not have been quite so naively idealistic about the future of their country, as is sometimes asserted. In any case, it gives us something to think about. That positive attitude to Shakespeare was evident amongst more moderate Irish nationalists too. Douglas Hyde, who would later become the first president of Ireland, celebrated the tercentenary of Shakespeare's death by contributing a poem in the Irish language to a celebratory book of homage to Shakespeare, edited by Israel Galatz and published in London the day before the Easter Rising began, not deliberately. Um, I was delighted to be able to make use of a copy of the actual volume which is available here at the Burns Library. Uh, it's a really fascinating book, well worth a look, a beautiful book as well. Um, but Hyde's poem is called An Rod Harlow the Gal Extratford Erin Allen, or in his own translation, How It Fared with a Gale at Stratford upon Avon. And it presents us with the story of what he calls a Carnock the Vunuk, so a Kern, or an Irish foot soldier, from the province of Munster. The Kern is exiled from Ireland, wanders through Britain, and finds himself in Stratford upon Avon, where, as you do, he falls asleep on the banks of a river and has a dream vision. And in the dream vision, he meets all of Shakespeare's characters, and they so delight him that when he wakes up, he has changed his opinion about England and the English. He says, There is one place in thy land, O Sassana, in which thy foe becomes blunt and blind, free from all hate, that is Stratford on the Avon. As Andrew Murphy informs us, the point of the poem is essentially that a wholly justified hatred of England is assuaged when an Irishman undergoes his Shakespearean experience. It get really fascinating for 1916. Now that's not to suggest that Hyde's attitude is entirely positive. I think it's probable that his decision to make the character a cur, uh, which as I said is an Irish foot soldier, was intended as a subtle rebuke uh, to Shakespeare. Because when Shakespeare mentions the Irish in the play Richard II, Richard refers to the Irish as rough, rug headed kerns, which live like venom where no venom else but only they have privilege to live. So the Irish are seen as vermin who need to be exterminated. Incidentally, the image that you see there is uh, of some Irish kerns, and it's prepared by Albrecht Durer. So it's from the 1520s. And I think it gives us a sense of their reputation in Europe, uh, and also, I think, illustrates what Richard meant by the rug-headed epithet. And the currents also appear in Macbeth, which Shakespeare wrote about 10 years later, where again, they have a fearsome reputation. So all through his writing career, he associated the currents with quite uh, negative things. But in any case, I think, leaving that negativity aside, Hyde's poem makes the case that even though Hyde believed Ireland should be de-anglicized, that didn't mean he thought it had to be rid of Shakespeare. Now this was even true at the Abbey Theatre, Ireland's national theatre. Um, I always look at the ads and Abbey show programmes to see not just what people were watching, but what kind of products were being sold to them at the time. And I want to talk briefly about an ad that appeared at the theatre from 1910 to about 1914, so in the years leading up to the Rising. And what it does is it uses a quotation from Shakespeare to encourage audiences to buy clothing. We can help you 
to follow Shakespeare's advice, they say. But then it reassures readers that the products are made only by Irish workers, and it offers a written guarantee that every product is Irish. This demonstrates, I think, how you could, be, you could have cultural nationalism, you could have economic nationalism, but you didn't need to get rid of Shakespeare. And that's at the end. So the turning point is 1916. After that year, productions of Shakespeare's plays in Ireland diminished massively in number. Visiting British companies did continue to come to Ireland. Uh, many people uh, still have very fond memories of the tour of Anna McMaster through rural Ireland, which took place right up to the 1960s, for example. Um, but elsewhere, there was a, tr a retreat from Shakespeare in national contexts. So the Dublin branch of the British Empire Shakespeare Society had been founded in 1907, but after Irish independence, it quietly changed its name to the Dublin Shakespeare Society. There were also intermittent attempts to translate Shakespeare into Irish, perhaps the best example being uh, this production of Macbeth by Tiger Magaliba, which was performed in Irish with a young Siobhan McKenna playing Lady Macbeth. That's from 1941. But in general, engagements with Shakespeare were half-hearted at best. Towards the end of their lives, uh, Yeats and Lady Gregory sought to revitalize the Abbey Theatre with new productions of Shakespeare. The first time the theatre performed Shakespeare was in a 1928 version of King Lear, which was intended to draw on the influence of German Expressionism in its set and costume design as we see here in these images prepared by the designer Dorothy Travis Smith. Um, really interesting images. After Gregory's death, there was a 1934 production of Macbeth, um, which featured a young Mary Manning as one of the witches, a production that was reportedly so upsetting for everybody that it confirmed her passion for playwriting over acting uh, forevermore. In 1936, Yeats hoped to provoke one last Abbey Theatre riot before he died, and he did so by encouraging the production of Coriolanus, because he had known that in Paris, French fascists, two years previously, had also put on the play uh, to think about the rule of the elite over the mob. So the theatre did put it on in 1936. Now, what I'm showing you here is an image of the lighting plan for that production, uh, which has been singed by the Abbey Fire from 1951. But from looking at it, it's fairly clear that it was a traditional production, um, and not perhaps as revolutionary as Yeats might have wished. But I guess my point is that for all three of these Abbey Shakespeare's, Irish audiences proved indifferent. Nobody rioted because nobody went. Now, after Coriolanus and after the death of Yeats, Shakespeare disappeared altogether from the repertoire of the Abbey Theatre for 40 years. When asked why, its manager, Ernest Blythe, was bluntly unrepentant. The Abbey do not produce foreign playwrights, he said. And so Shakespeare disappeared from the repertoire of the theatre until 1971. I think it's worth pointing out here that during those years, under Blythe's leadership, the theatre staged plays by Chekhov, by Brecht, by Lorca, and by a great number of other European and world dramatists. So clearly here, when he said foreign playwrights, he meant English playwrights. I think it's really important that we see what a severe change this was. I mean, you can see evidence right back to the 1720s that shows that when Irish writers and Irish audiences thought about Shakespeare, they thought Shakespeare belonged to them because Shakespeare belonged to everybody. But Blythe Zappi simply ignored Shakespeare, an act that was completely unprecedented in Irish theatrical history. Now, you know, we can look at this in a variety of ways. Some people will say this is a necessary act of decolonization. You have to banish Shakespeare in order to find your way back. Others will say it's an example of Irish provincialism. It was the wrong thing to do. Either way, I think it's reasonable to propose that the alienation of Ireland and England from each other especially after the 1930s, has some sort of uh, exemplum in the fact that Shakespeare was also absent from the stage of the Abbey during those periods. So that is why I see 1916 as a turning point. Looking back, we, we might see the celebratory Irish Times supplement that never made it into print as a powerful emblem for what happened. 
It was intended to celebrate a tradition that had a long and respected place in Irish life, but it disappeared. We know the supplement existed, but no one has been able to find any trace of it. So it was with Shakespeare on the Irish stage. Thousands of productions were seen by hundreds of thousands of Irish people over several centuries, and Irish people from all walks of life. But most of those productions were written out of history as independent Ireland came into being. The history of Irish theatre started in the 1890s, uh, was the official line. Now this is not to suggest that Shakespeare was never performed after 1922, but rather that there was judged to be an incompatibility between Shakespeare and Irishness. So Shakespeare continued to torture generations of Irish schoolchildren, uh, and so had a central part of the education system. And it was also considered acceptable for visiting companies to perform his work if they came from abroad. But the idea that Shakespeare might have a place on the Irish stage was not just controversial, but in some senses it was quite literally unimaginable. It, it didn't enter people's head to even think about it. And I think this gives rise to some interesting, but undoubtedly muddled thinking. A very clear example of this is the place of Shakespeare in the early years of Ireland's second great theatre, which is The Gate. So in 1932, they uh, produced an excellent, by all accounts, an excellent version of Hamlet, which was one of the very first um, professional acting jobs of Orson Welles, who had come to Dublin and, and essentially lied his way onto the stage of the gate. Uh, he played Hamlet's ghost. But later in the decade, later in the 1930s, they brought their productions, including Hamlet, on tour to the Balkans and to Malta and to Egypt. And they did this on the eve of the Second World War. And they didn't call themselves the Dublin Gate Theatre, they called themselves the English Players. Now why did they do this? It was partly because they were funded by the British Council, who thought that by sending this theatre company to these strategically vulnerable places, they might help to, uh, I guess, reduce the attractiveness of Nazism in those uh, countries. But I think it was also because there was a belief that a theatre company could not be both Irish and Shakespearean at the same time. It just didn't seem conceivable. There's another interesting example of a kind of cultural confusion, and that's in the Irish attitude to Laurence Olivier's version of Henry V, a film that perhaps some of you might have seen. The idea of this film was put forward by the British Ministry of Information during World War II as a film that might bolster the patriotism and resilience of English audiences. So it was premiered shortly after D-Day, and if you had seen it in England at that time, the, the first title would have said that the film is dedicated to the commandos and airborne troops of Great Britain, the spirit of whose ancestors it has humbly attempted to recapture. So I mean, this is a wartime Henry V. However, its outdoor scenes were filmed in neutral Ireland, which meant that when it was released in Ireland in 1945, there was huge excitement in the country about it. You know, newspaper reports saying, like, Agincourt as it was fought in Carroll's Court, uh, just outside of, of Dublin. So you get this really interesting blurring of, you know, English propaganda, British nationalism, and the way in which Irish identity on the world stage is starting to be affected by cinema, uh, all happening at the same time. We get a particularly interesting example of this when the film premieres here in Boston in 1946 and the Irish newspapers run reports talking about how impressed Time Magazine was with the scenery in County Wicklow. And that's the news. Time Magazine likes us. Even so, um, Shakespeare remained the subject of indifference in the main. Um, given the brilliant exhibition on Flann O'Brien that's on here at the moment, I had to bring up an example of Flann's uh, responses to some of these productions. So when Tyrone Guthrie brought his revolutionary modern dress Hamlet to Dublin in 1950, audiences were unimpressed, and the person who was most impressed was Flann O'Brien. And writing in the Irish Times, he asked a question. Is it safe to play classics in modern dress if people suspect that A, the actors are too lazy to arrive in time and to change costume, or B, that certain characters in crowd scenes were dragged from the pub across the street five minutes previously, he said. So that's it, you, you make fun of it. At, where all around the world when this production was done, people flocked to it as an example of really exciting practice. 
Um, even the return of Orson Welles to the Belfast and Dublin stages failed to excite much enthusiasm. Uh, this is a show program from 1959 when Welles staged uh, a version of Chimes at Midnight, which is his conflation of the two parts of Henry IV and Henry V into one play. Later becomes one of his most admired films, but in Dublin didn't really get a lot of attention. Uh, here on the screen, on your right, this is a publicity shot of Wells playing Falstaff in Belfast. I love that photo. I just love it. And then on the left, a, a slightly uh, a different photo. This is from the, the film version itself, six years later. Now the Dublin production was seen mostly by Irish school children, and there's a line in the Irish Times Review that reflects upon this. Uh, the theatre critic writes, School children in Ireland now abed will boast of seeing chimes at midnight, I hope, when Elvis is long forgotten. <laughs> kind of clearly showing where his cultural values lay. Uh, but it was a flop. Audiences didn't go, so it was withdrawn for a series of evenings with Orson Welles, in which he told stories about himself, about his time in Dublin in the 1930s. Uh, they're on YouTube, well worth a look. Irish audiences, again, showing that they had a preference for stories that are about themselves as seen through the kind of mediating influence. Uh, not so much of Hollywood, but certainly of international cinema. So when do things start to change? Uh, 1971 is when the Abbey's de facto ban on Shakespeare is lifted. And it's lifted when the English director Hugh Hunt stages Macbeth there. This is from the show programme for that production, and I think it reveals quite a lot. So we get the usual things you find in a show program, advertisements, but then in the first page of texts, you get the words, why Shakespeare? Now, I don't want to exaggerate this, but I think it's likely no national theatre anywhere in the world before ever felt the need to ask that question, because the answer is seen as so self-evident. Of course he stayed Shakespeare. But nevertheless, Hunt felt compelled to address it. It has rightly been claimed, he said, by British and American actors that to play Shakespeare is the final test of an actor's quality. And he expressed a determination to produce Shakespeare's work in a manner commensurate with his world importance. So he's not foreign anymore, is the, is the subtext there. But in that reference to actors, British and American actors, you can kind of detect uh, what is evident for the rest of the decade, which is an Irish inferiority complex about their ability to stage Shakespeare uh, correctly. And as you can see, it's not a great photo, but this is from the original production. You can see that they gave a very traditional version of Macbeth. I would say really though that the, the ghost of the feast in this production of Macbeth was undoubtedly the outbreak of the troubles in Northern Ireland. And it's unquestionably true that the renewal of the troubles in Northern Ireland, or the outbreak of the troubles in Northern Ireland, meant that people were thinking about Anglo-Irish relations in new ways. And so it's highly significant that this is the period when the National Theatre starts to think about Shakespeare again. And you get this in other contexts too. In 1972, there was a Celtic Hamlet um, staged by Cyril Cusack when the actors were all dressed in green and all of the action was reset to the Emerald Isle. So the kind of catchphrase for the production was, something's rotten in the state of Ireland. <laughs> so this was prepared in the immediate wake of Bloody Sunday, and the characterization of Ireland as a kind of failed state, or at least as a state that had failed to live up to what people wanted for it, uh, was what this production was trying to do. Other productions would follow at the Abbey, many of them directed by younger artists, um, people like Joe Dowling, who, who went on to have such an impact on the American theatre, also featuring many emerging actors. So this is a 1980 production of The Winter's Tale, directed by Patrick Mason. Um, some of you might recommend, recognize Colomini, uh, depending on whether, if, you know, from The Commitments or Star Trek, depending on your persuasion. <laughs> Who's the person on the far left? Liam Neeson, yeah. So this is a young Liam Neeson appearing in Winter's Tale. That was the last time he appeared on the stage of the Abbey Theatre because a few months later he was filming Excalibur and it all took off from there. We would also see though that Shakespeare was a way for Ireland to thumb its nose at its nearest neighbour. Um, a great example of this is in 1983. The Abbey staged a production of Hamlet which was directed by the British director, Michael Bogdanov. 
And that choice of director was no accident at all, because Bogdanov, three years earlier, had faced the charge of obscenity when he directed the play Romans in Britain at the National Theatre in London. So we just think about this, you know, Dublin Theatre takes the guy who's been accused of obscenity in London and puts him on their national stage. In addition to that, as you can perhaps infer from the poster, Bogdanov gave a production that was perceived as a criticism of Britain's war in the Falkland Islands at that time as well. So very provocative. So I think, you know, we can see this as a mildly provocative act of Anglo-Irish table turning that has to be seen in the context of contemporary events. This is in the immediate aftermath of the hunger strikes. Um, they're not trying to be provocative, they're not trying to be offensive, but there's certainly a bit of saber rattling um, going on, I think. Now, of course, that negativity would flow in both directions. Um, when Peter O'Toole played Hamlet at the National in London in the early 1960s, his performance was very frequently criticized because of his Irishness. And when you read the newspaper reviews, it becomes clear that the word Irish is kind of used interchangeably with words like drunken and belligerent, as if they all mean the same thing. And once the troubles began, productions of Henry V in England restored Captain MacMorris, where his bomb-making skills were given great emphasis. Of course, audiences thinking about the IRA's bombing campaign in places like Guildford and Birmingham. But even so, Shakespeare would also become a way for people to think about reconciliation. Uh, the poems and essays of Seamus Heaney do this at great length. There's some very good examples, including a 1972 Heaney poem called Traditions, in which he follows the example of Joyce in taking on Mac Morris from Henry V. Mac Morris, gallivanting around the globe, whinged to courtier and groundling, who had heard tell of us as going very bare of learning, as wild hares, as anatomies of death. What ish my nation? And Heaney, too, would explore the Elizabethan roots of Hiberno-English speech. We are proud of our Elizabethan English. Varsity, for example, is grassroots stuff with us. We deem, or we allow, when we suppose, and some cherished archaisms are correct experience. So in essays after this, Shakespeare would think about the, or sorry, Heaney would think about the relationship between Shakespeare and Yeats as what he would call a, a symbol adequate to our predicament, a way of moving things forward. And there would be other symbols adequate to our predicament. Uh, one example is that in 1997, shortly before the second IRA ceasefire was declared, Kenneth Branagh staged the European premiere of his film version of Hamlet at the Waterfront Hall in his native Belfast. Described to Belfast audiences as Your Boy by Julie Christie, Brana ensured that his premier raised money for local charities. And one of those charities, quite interestingly, aimed to give funding to local actors who wanted a train, which really meant they'd have to leave Northern Ireland, as Brana had done himself. But if we read press reports at the time, we find that far from being in conflict with each other, Britishness and Irishness existed, coexisted, harmoniously in the way in which people spoke about Brana's uh, Hamlet. And of course, the, the presence of so many Hollywood actors like Christie was an undoubted lubricant in that relationship too. So in the years since the Good Friday Agreement of 1998, the relationship between Ireland and the UK is often described as having been normalized, though you know, admittedly in the last three years that word maybe is less applicable. Even so, Ireland has settled into a pattern of Shakespearean production that mirrors trends in other Anglophone countries, especially the United States, actually. So perhaps our tradition has also normalized. So as is the case here, there are sometimes tensions in Ireland between tradition and innovation in the staging of Shakespeare's plays. And we still sometimes get this suggestion that actors, whether American or Irish, can't deliver Shakespeare's lines properly. Um, whatever properly means. In Ireland, as in other countries, A Midsummer Night's Dream has become Shakespeare's most frequently abused play, as we see here from a gate theatre production that seems to reimagine the story as happening in a kind of sadomasochistic disco. <laughs> 
There have also been important productions, though, reset to rural Ireland, making Shakespeare uh, the chap that writes like Martin McDonough, perhaps, as in a celebrated rough magic production of The Taming of the Shrew, directed by Lynn Parker, um, which was part Father Ted and part Playboy of the Western world. Um, you'll see Polly McQuinn there on your left, who played Mrs. Doyle in Father Ted. That was followed by an impressive Belfast production, also by Lynn Parker, of Macbeth, one that was revelatory in allowing actors to deliver the lines in their own Ulster accents, showing us how closely Shakespeare's English matches the dialects of Northern Ireland today. Since the turn of the century, though, we are also seeing the emergence of a distinctive Irish tradition of staging Shakespeare. And again, I don't want to exaggerate the links, but just as Ireland is now having to contemplate a future in the European Union that does not include Britain within the EU, so are Irish theatre makers developing an understanding of Shakespeare where they're not looking for validation from London or from Stratford, as would have been the case for most of the 20th century. There's one really great example of this which uh, occurred last year in Dublin when the Gate Theatre again staged Hamlet but with the Irish actress Ruth Negga playing the lead role. So in that casting, the Gate were both gesturing to the past of Irish theatre and reflecting upon Irish society today. As I've already mentioned, Dublin is the site of the first recorded performance of Hamlet by a woman in 1741. So Nega was not, therefore, the first woman to play Hamlet in Ireland. She is, however, the first person of colour to take the role in an Irish production. And so, while it was not overstated, it did feel significant that at a time when Britain's uh, movement towards Brexit was in part caused by fears of migration, the gate was casting an Irish actor whose parents had come from Limerick and from Ethiopia. She herself was born in Addis Ababa. As directed by the South African Yale Farber, this was a Hamlet that was wholly and unapologetically at home in Ireland. It wasn't provocative like the Hamlet from 1983, it just was Irish. Lines were delivered in the actor's own accent, and the cultural context repeatedly referenced Irish Catholicism. A good example of this is that when Claudius prayed, or tries to pray, he does so not in Protestant solitude, as happens in Shakespeare's script. He confesses to a Catholic priest, and it worked. So this is very different from 1932, when the Gates founders had to pretend to be English in order to stage Hamlet in Cairo. But perhaps the most significant event in this context, and this is the last one I'm going to talk about, is the 2015 production of Druid Shakespeare, directed by Gary Hines for her Galway-based theatre company, Druid. Again, following in the tradition of things like Chimes at Midnight, Druid Shakespeare is a conflation of some of Shakespeare's history plays, uh, taking about 14 hours worth of theatre and condensing it down to six hours. Now, interestingly, the script, which was edited by Marco Rowe, cuts most of Shakespeare's references to Ireland. So Richard II's line about, you know, the rogue-headed curves, that stays because it's such a good line. Um, but McMorris is gone. He's cut completely. Um, a very good example, at the end of Henry V in Shakespeare's script, Henry V is wooing the French princess. And he says to her, I will give you all my kingdoms. I'll give you France. I'll give you England. I'll give you Ireland. Uh, which is, again, quite a provocative line nowadays, of course. Well, Drew had cut that entire scene. And they replaced it instead with a scene in which Falstaff dies. So the last impression we have in this play is not of Hal's victories, as, which is what Shakespeare wrote, it's of his betrayal of his father figure. But what's important, I think, is that these omissions, they make very, very little difference to the plays themselves. And that tells us something about how Ireland was seen in the time of Shakespeare in England. You can cut the references and it changes nothing. It was seen as very incidental. However, a world of Hines did keep a feature of Henry V that is frequently overlooked in discussions of Shakespeare and Ireland, and that is that the play includes a brief phrase in the Irish language. So yes, Shakespeare wrote a little bit of Irish. This happens in a scene in which Pistol encounters a French-speaking soldier who demands to know if he's a gentleman. 
And because Pistol can't understand him, now Pistol is an English soldier, he responds with a phrase that is in Irish. Kaliti, Kali no kosturame, he says. Now it took about 200 years for somebody to work this out. Uh, it was a Shakespeare scholar from Ireland called Edmund Malone. But this appears to be an attempt to render the title of an Irish folk song, Colleen o Costura May, in order to express Pistol's view that the Frenchman is speaking gibberish. Now there's a bit of a dispute about what the meaning of the song is. Some people think it means the girl from the banks of the river shore, others that it means uh, a dear little treasure, you know, Colleen o Costura. But the song was published in London in 1584, and it was said to have been one of the favorites <coughs> of Queen Elizabeth. So Shakespeare most likely was aware of it. So when Pistol speaks Irish to a French soldier, we find Shakespeare intermixing the Irish wars of the 1590s with Henry's war in France in 1415. And that's a comparison that runs through the play, and it makes it uncomfortable viewing for Irish audiences even now. First time I saw Henry V was in England, and they had taken out all the references to Ireland and replaced them with the word Iraq. And this was just after the invasion of that country. So you can get a sense of how provocative the Irish presence is in that play. But I think the fragment of Irish language being used in this, uh, it introduces a bit of ambiguity. It's a love song, after all. So it's a play that gives us the Irish as threatening, but also as a figure of erotic desire, even love. And you know, as is always true with Shakespeare, every time we think we've identified a truth, he gives us a completely contradictory statement that is also true. So just as MacMorris, the Irishman, mangles the English language when he says, what is my nation? So we have Pistol, the Englishman, mangling the Irish language when he tries to say, Colleen O'Costurame. And we get this all through the play, as when the French princess Catherine gets an English lesson that unintentionally leads her into lots of hilarious uh, crudity. So it's like everyone who tries to speak another language in this play ends up getting bogged down in unexpected ways. And this is something that we Irish critics have maybe a little bit narcissistically overlooked in our rush to always have a problem with MacMorris. Well, Drew Shakespeare made sure we thought about it again. And but the other really important feature of the production was the use of cross-gender casting, um, with women sometimes playing male roles and vice versa. So, so not always, but sometimes. Now, as I've already said, this approach is far from new with Shakespeare. We've had women playing Hamlet since the 1740s. But in Drew's production, what this does is it allows us to think about gender and Anglo-Irish culture down through the centuries. So in books, in poems, and in plays, Ireland was often presented as feminine to English masculinity. And so we have lots of love stories that are about the desirability of political union between England and Ireland. Uh, a good example of this is Diane Boussico's love story in The Shock Rock. And um, Ireland, the woman in this play, may have been seen as humane and amusing, where the English soldier is disciplined but dull. But there is no mistaking the fact that, as the feminine partner in the relationship, Ireland was ultimately expected to be passive and subservient. And you know, the body language shows all of this quite clearly. So I think Drew are picking up on this, and they do it in the cross-gender casting. Um, some of it just for comedic effect. So here we are seeing Mistress Quickly, uh, played by John Olihan, who, if you can't see the photo clearly or you think your eyes are deceiving you, yes, it is a middle-aged man with a beard uh, playing a woman, as a self-evidently grotesque and camp figure. Now, I've sometimes suspected that this role might have been played in Shakespeare's time not by a boy actor, but by a fully grown man, because a lot of the jokes that Quickly says in the play seem based on the fact that she is asserting uh, having a female body when clearly she doesn't. And I think Drew pick up on that. But I also think they're gesturing back to pantomime, to the idea of the cross-dressing pantomime dame, uh, and thereby reminding us that Shakespeare in Ireland for most of the 19th century was part of a popular tradition, not a literary one. But with Drew, the really most important thing is that the major male roles, two in many ways, were played by women. Dervla Crotty on your left played Henry IV, and Ashley O'Sullivan on your right played Henry V. 
And I think we have to see those transformations in the way that I've described. If Ireland was always the blushing bride to England's macho saviour, then here we have a reappropriation when you have these very manly English kings being played by Irish women who make no effort to disguise their gender or their uh, national identity. Indeed, what Crotty did is that as her character's uh, illness progressed, as he moved towards death, her costume began to reveal more and more of her body, making its status as biologically female much more evident to the audience. And so Crotty has said is that what she was trying to do here is to show how masculinity is not something that people are born with, it is something that we learn to perform. And this affects how we see gender, but it also affects how we see political power as well. So I think this is all thinking about centuries of gender-based stereotyping. So really, I would say probably the most important feature of this production, and this is true for a lot of Irish productions over the last 10 years or so, is the use of the Irish voice of accent. And this reminds me a bit of something Brian Friel said when he argued that Irish audiences were forced to make what he called a double assumption when they watched the great plays of world drama. So he says, when you see something uh, by Chekhov, you do so in scripts that are redolent of either Edwardian England or the Bloomsbury set, because those translations had been moved from Russian into versions for audiences in London. So Friel was saying that Irish readers and actors needed to translate the great world classics twice, once from, in this case, Russian into Standard English, and then from Standard English into English as it's understood in Ireland. In some way, we are constantly overshadowed by the sound of the English language, he said, as well as by the printed word. Maybe this does not inhibit us, but it forms us and shapes us in a way that is neither healthy nor valuable. So what I want to suggest is where we are now is that Irish theatre companies have worked past that double assumption insofar as it affects Shakespeare, which in the past usually involved the delivery of lines in an English that was redolent of Edwardian England or the Bloomsbury set. And I would suggest that in those productions, Shakespeare was made doubly foreign to Irish audiences, first by the original language and then by the representation of his words in what was perceived to be the correct way, but was merely a tradition that had been handed down to us in the middle of the 20th century by actors like Olivier and John Gilbert. In presenting Shakespeare with Irish rhythms and sounds, Drude followed Heaney and they followed Joyce in suggesting that the Irish accent might even be more hospitable, in some ways, to Shakespeare's text. After all, a great deal of the English spoken in Ireland is the English of Shakespeare's era and the century that followed it. In England in the 17th century, the word tea would have been pronounced tay. The word devil would have been pronounced divil. And the word phil would have been pronounced philip. And all of those pronunciations are seen now as distinctively Irish and as deviations from a correct form of standard English. So I think what Drude's mode of line delivery do is it becomes a kind of time capsule that is also a declaration of independence. So this is why it's true to say that within the Irish theatre community, Shakespeare really is the chap that writes like sing, because Drude has said that they would never have been able to find their way to Shakespeare without first achieving mastery over John Millington Singh. So, we live, as we all know, in uncertain times. Um, the ongoing debates about Brexit mean that it's impossible to predict the status of Anglo-Irish relations uh, you know, next week, let alone next year. I, you know, I, I could walk out of this room and something might have happened in Europe that was wholly unexpected. That's where we are at the moment. So there's a lot of uncertainty. But I think in looking through that uncertainty, we see this century-long history of interactions that are sometimes positive, sometimes negative, sometimes affectionate, sometimes provocative. What we can see is that Shakespeare is a bridge between Ireland and England. And at a time when people are putting up walls, literal and real, between cultures, there's something very valuable about the fact that Ireland now is turning to Shakespeare uh, as a space to think about itself, to think about England, and to continue to exchange ideas and people and culture. Thank you.
days. Um, so it's going to give me nightmares tonight because I have the misfortune of seeing that in summer night's dream set in a leather bar. <laughs> I found that image traumatic. However, well, it's really brilliant in so, so many ways. So we have time for a few minutes of questions. Would you like to ask? make a comment? Yes. So like we were, you were saying, I think, or someone was saying in the, in the uh, conference a couple few days ago, a lot of the history of theater is also the history of the audience. Yes. So I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about just who were the audiences through history? Mm -hmm. uh, English ascendancy people, Irish Catholic, middle class, lower class, yeah. rural. Um, so so that, you know, it varies through time. So certainly in, in the early years, it was true that it was an ascendancy audience. But one of the key moments I think occurs in the early 1720s, uh, when there's a benefit production for weavers that is held in Smock Alley, and there's a production of Hamlet. So the audience goes, they pay their money, and the money goes to support weavers who are being affected by laws about um, the importation of clothing from England. And Jonathan Swift writes a poem where he calls for, it's like the Adam and the Abbey program, he calls for Irish audiences to buy Irish products, or products made in Ireland. Uh, so that kind of economic nationalism that we see. And he says, we're going to take English costumes, we'll throw them out. We're going to take English food, we're not going to buy it. But then he says, we're going to keep Shakespeare. And this to me is, I mean, there's a lot more to be said about that, but I, this is the beginning of evidence that yes, it was an ascendancy audience, yes, it was Anglo Irish, but it wasn't quite as simple as the black and white was in then that we see. In the 19th century, Shakespeare was, he was a popular playwright. I mean, you, you can't have that many productions of his plays unless everybody is going to see it. And uh, my friend Mark Feenan, who's a lecturer at Queen's University, tells a story about how there was a visiting English production in, I think, the late 1880s uh, with a very famous English actor, not Henry Irving, but somebody of that status, who was playing Hamlet in Belfast before a huge audience of thousands of people. And he started to give one of the famous Hamlet soliloquies, and a voice from the very, very cheapest seats shouted down to say, you're not doing it right. <laughs> and so it was a guy from the shipyards in Belfast who came down on stage and told the actor how he should have done the soliloquy. Mm. And the actor said, yeah, you're right. <laughs> uh, and he did it the right way. Uh, the right way. And then, you know, on other occasions, uh, people in, in Belfast in particular would bring what was called Belfast confetti to productions of Shakespeare. Um, Belfast confetti being rivets from the shipyards that they would, you know, uh, <laughs> throw at uh, things uh, that they didn't like. So, so it, it varies through time, and uh, as I said, it's, it's, it's very deep. Once we start to, to look at it in any detail, all of the generalizations about Ireland and England and the Anglo-Irish quickly become much more interesting. So you mentioned Cyril Cusack. Yeah. In 1987, I saw a production of Macbeth in London with Sinead Cusack mm -hmm. as Lady Macbeth, I believe. Um, was Sinead Irish born? Yeah. So, I think so. Does, yeah. does this throw, does this I suppose, a Spaniard in the works? Um, or, or not, I'm just wondering if that's part of your interest as well. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's crossing it, uh, the other way. It's a really important thing that so many of the great Shakespearean actors, uh, starting with Charles Macklin in the, in the 18th century, are Irish. And so Kenneth Branagh is an example of that. Fiona Shaw is an example of that too. And even right now, there's a, there is a King Lear, which is on in New York, and uh, Glenda Jackson is playing Lear, so you might have seen this being reported. But Ashley O'Sullivan, who's, this is Ashley right here, is playing uh, Regan O'Gonnell. And so this is, this is an undeniable element of the thing that Irish actors have been part of the Shakespearean tradition all the way through but begins to feed in with a lot of other things too. Just quickly show you, this is Fiona Shaw. Um, again, some of you will know her from being Fiona Shaw, some of you will know her from Harry Potter. Um, if you're watching Killing Eve, she's in that at the moment too. But in the mid-1990s, having established an amazing reputation as a British Shakespearean, she came to Ireland to do a production of Hamlet with Irish actors. And she took it on tour all through rural Ireland. Um, there was a protest in Cork by a school teacher because Shaw's production included nudity. 
And you might think that this was on the grounds of indecency, but it was actually because the person thought that's not how you do Shakespeare properly. <laughs> so I think that's very revealing too. So, so this is the, the point. Figures like Cusack, um, they go back and forth all the time. And, and so it's, it's, it's about taking these categories we're used to and seeing that Shakespeare explodes them all. Yeah. I actually saw that in your last yeah. <laughs> that, that It was John Lynch, wasn't it? They had that really one scene. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I actually took a scene in. But um, in Dublin. But I actually I was going to ask a different question, which was about um, the regional theaters and the theater festivals in the, you know, in the 1930s, 1940s. Is there any evidence of whether they played Shakespeare? Because they were much more conventional and needed large ensemble casts. I mean, Shakespeare continues to uh, to draw on you know large popular audiences through Ireland. So I mentioned MacMaster. Um, some of you might know this. Harold Pinter, the great Nobel Prize winning dramatist, got his start as an actor by going on tour through rural Ireland with MacMaster playing Shakespeare. And he tells the story of how in 1950, um, MacMaster's business manager Joe Nolan comes into the room and says, "Guess what? All the cinemas in Limerick are on strike." And MacMaster says, book Limerick, instantly. <laughs> and so off they go. And uh, Pinter, if I remember correctly, was playing Iago to MacMaster's Othello. Now that's memory, so maybe flawed, but he certainly had a prominent role. And he, they took over a cinema in Limerick. It was St. Patrick's Night. They were supposed to start at half nine, but because the pubs were still open, nobody showed up until half eleven. And as Pinter writes, they were all drunk. <laughs> So you had 2,000 people on St. Patrick's Night who had been drinking all day and were coming to see Shakespeare, which they didn't know at all. And Pinter writes about the skill of McMaster in getting the audience to keep quiet and watch. And then two and a half hours later, they erupted with applause. Mm -hmm. So these are the kind of memories that people have, particularly of McMaster. And again, it's very much in that popular tradition, not the elitist uh, literary one that we're associated with. So, so, yeah, but this is the point. It's mostly people, uh, like my master, who have very strong associations with Ireland, coming on tour. Yeah. So we're saying, in that case, so we always wouldn't have known Shakespeare. So this is a whole different tactical of question that maybe goes back to the microphone again. So as an American student, I would have read um, Shakespeare with my classmates probably in the second year of secondary school, and I certainly had vivid memories of it. My English uh, professor is a, is a senior, you know, fourth year in their secondary system, you know, beating the class down on the rest. We, we learned and read a lot of Shakespeare. Would, would an Irish student, would, in secondary or later, as a leading search, where, where would somebody have encountered Shakespeare yeah. if not on the stage? So typically an Irish student who has left school at the age of 18 will have studied two Shakespeare plays, one at, at the kind of intermediate level and one as part of the leading certificate. And they're, they're the kind of the, the canon, essentially, Hamlet, Macbeth, Othello, Romeo and Juliet. Very few of the comedies, not the history plays at all. You know. Oh, John of Gaunt, thrice honored in Lancaster, hast thou according to thy oath and bond hither brought Henry of Hertford, thy bold son, hither to make bold good his both his leg bold against the Duke of Norfolk, yeah. Thomas yeah. Mowbray, that's Richard II, which I did for the interest of Yeah, this is so remember. No, 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 but this is the stumbling. So, yeah, that's a rare. No, no, this, this is exactly that's how Shakespeare. So, for a long time, it's another yeah. Yeah. Um, But what's interesting about it is that, as, as somebody, I mean, I teach Irish literature, I also do teach Shakespeare, and I find that I, I would have students who, at the age of 18, will come to university and will be brilliant at identifying kind of bird imagery in King Lear, mm -hmm. but might not ever have been told by their teachers that, um, that the female characters in Lear were played by boys. And so, therefore, Shakespeare is, is taught as literature, and it's still that kind of Victorian idea of Shakespeare is inherently improving. Um, no, no, I'm not knocking Irish teachers, I'm just saying that's the, the position of the curriculum. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. A quick question. You've talked a couple of times that Shakespeare, oh, further back, being kind of in the popular tradition, and now obviously we have this like, more elitist yeah. idea of it. When did that shift come about, do you think? I think it kind of happened when, when that happened with theatre generally, really, is that the arrival of cinema meant that the 2,000, 3,000 theatres that, that dominated Dublin, Belfast, Cork, um, began to, to do other things. And so, it, you know, it's still the case that the biggest popular theatre in, in Ireland is the Grand Canal Theatre in Dublin, hundreds and hundreds of seats. 
and they recently had a visiting production of Macbeth. Um, so it, it does still happen in that way. But it's partly to do with the fact that um, in Ireland, theatre has become, um, I would hesitate to say at least, that's not true, certainly compared to, to other countries. But, but the thing where you have 3,000 people seeing the show doesn't really happen so much. That, but he, he does appear in um, he does appear in political discourse in interesting ways. So Charles Haughey famously said that he had done the state some service, for example. Um, so in other words, when he was looking back on his tenure as a teacher that, that had been disgraced because of financial impropriety and a lot of other things, he drew on Othello to say that actually he wasn't all that bad, or at least he was bad and did some things that were good which I think is a really interesting kind of comparison and the fact that he used Shakespeare to do that is part of it as well. Um, beyond that, I just don't know yet, but I hope to find out in the next, in the next couple of years as I continue to, to explore this, this work. One last question. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, you know, you have this uh, sort of uh, related to Shakespeare as an industry. Shakespeare's an industry not only in the UK, but certainly here in the US, there are dozens of large, Institutional theaters uh, devoted to Shakespeare's work and branding themselves as Shakespeare theaters. Um, what's the prospect or likelihood of a major institutional theater in Ireland focused and dedicated centrally to the canon of Shakespeare? Mm. Uh, I think it's unlikely that that would happen, certainly any time in, in the foreseeable future. And it is partly to do with the fact that there is still a very strong belief in Ireland that if you're supporting new theatre, usually when, when funding agencies think of that, they're imagining a play written by an Irish person that is about Ireland, and they prioritise that. And that's the decision that they've made, and not really objecting to it. But I think politically it would be difficult to do it. I would also add, though, that after a really strong period of funding and expansion in the late 1990s, the 2008 crash uh, that we all know about affected the Irish theatre very severely. So that now you've got maybe five companies that are making theatre full time, and everybody else kind of doing it on a, on a project by project basis. So at the moment, I think Irish theatre is is quite vulnerable, just doing the day to day things of bringing in audiences, supporting the Irish canon. Uh, you know, like the Irish government will say that they're going to change this in the next ten years, and there'll be more funding, and that's very positive. But I think we have to get there before a project like the one you're describing. Awesome. And, and of course, people will always go to London and just quite easily these days. Well, unless we need a visa. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, just a few things. Among the uh, Irish actors, there was a guy called Gerard Murphy from Newry in the Fade of it. Um, though the Abbey, I didn't, you know, I saw the production of the Abbey, it was quite a good one in 1979, the Midsummer Night Stream with, with uh, Barry McGovern, which I thought was very good. It's awesome. Yeah. It's all right. Yeah. Anyway, and finally, a little anecdote from my own personal experience. As people have mentioned, Cyril Cusack and Chekhov. I'm going to bring them together. I don't know when this was. Let's look it up. There was a production of the Three Sisters. You know this at the gate with the three Cusack girls as the three sisters. And I've never seen anything more disgraceful in my life than the behaviour of their father. You know about this? No. They're, they're so the, the, the three sisters, played by his daughters, were. Um, Downstage in a very important scene, the father was playing a minor role, the role of the doctor. He was upstage, sitting at a chair reading a newspaper. And as they were doing their very important stuff, he got up, he stretched, he rattled the newspaper. This is called upstaging. He behaved in the most disgraceful way to his own children. Anyway, I suppose he was an old man, he didn't care. Um, I wonder what they said about it afterwards. Maybe they didn't see it. Anyway, uh, um, I want to thank Patrick uh, very much for an absolutely fascinating and wonderful uh, lecture. And, uh,